Hey, it's Hugh Hewitt, and when I want to know what's going on with the Cavs, the Browns, and the Tribe, I tune into Sports Fix. Hey guys, J-Rock here from the Sports Fix, and we always talk about using our platform to try to help the world and the society we live in, and everywhere I go and everywhere we go, bullying is one of the problems in today's society. There's nothing worse than any person, big or small, strong or weak, adult or child, feeling picked on, pushed around, vulnerable, and victimized at the hands of a bully. Change comes one person at a time, and my good friends that know such thing as a bully are working on skills and techniques and ways that we can all change and make things better for everyone. Find out more at nosuchthingasabully.com. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Let's see if anybody can hear me here. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for this. I'll tell you what, we were about a half a second away from redoing this whole thing on Wednesday. I'm going to tell you right now, um, as there's more things going on in the background. I cannot tell you what is going on. Welcome into the Sports Fix. If you're here, if you're listening, I doubt anybody's still here 13 minutes into this debacle right here. I'm going to tell you right now, this was a bad start, and I apologize. Let's... Take a deep breath here and circle back around five minutes before this thing went off on the air. As you know, we've been off for the last week. And as we're getting ready to go on the air, five minutes before we do, the entire thing implodes here. The computer have to reboot everything. It takes 10 minutes to get it back up and running. I get the show on the air late. And then here we go again with some more technical difficulties. Hopefully all of you aren't hearing this because some things went crazy and haywire again. I don't even know. Who heard what? I know the music played forever. Here we are uh, a quarter way through a segment here into the show and just just now getting on the air, just now getting off and running with today's episode. I sincerely apologize for this and uh, all we can do is keep it moving here at this point, but <sighs> take a deep breath. Woosah time right here. Unbelievable uh, what we just went through here. Nick Swisher doesn't even live in this town anymore and his... His godforsaken baseball ability is now blessing the people of Atlanta, yet somehow I must have still offended the uh, Nick Swisher stinks at baseball gods or something here because that's usually what happens when the show goes haywire. It was right after I finished criticizing Bro Ohio, but uh, he's not even here anymore, and his ghost is lingering on. All right, guys, let's get rocking and rolling. I'm just going to... We'll condense things here. We'll get in a quick introduction. We'll get to a break. We'll get Dan Wismar in on the conversation. And I swear we'll try to talk some sports here, you guys, as we get back in the swing of things here on the Sports Fix. Let's uh, let's start from scratch here. Welcome into the Sports Fix, you guys. I am your host, the big daddy on the microphone, usually in a much better mood here, Jerry Myers. J-Rock, call me what you will. You can call me highly perturbed and aggravated at the circumstances to start today's show, but you can also call me glad to be back on the air, rocking and rolling with you guys. And look, it's live radio. This is the this is the beauty of what we do. You never know what can happen. You deal with it, and you keep it moving, kind of like in the ring. Oh, boy. <laughs> there, was some, there, was, uh, there was some stories coming out of this weekend, speaking of in the ring too but uh i'll tell those in a minute we'll get rolling j-rock here the sports fix on the air tons of things to talk about browns got an exhibition game in the books got another one coming up dan wismar from the cleveland fan from everybody hates cleveland he'll be with us here today we'll talk about the browns some of the people that may have you know moved up some charts down some charts etc and so forth here we'll talk about the first exhibition action we'll talk some indians baseball here with dan wismar as well buckeyes training camp rolling we'll go talk about them getting going as they head into a season of ex- expectations double digit favorites in every single game this season 
uh, unheard of. We'll talk about all of that here coming up with Dan Wismar. NFL's rocking and rolling. So much more to do, you guys. Welcome in, as we say, to the Sports Fix. Whether you're listening live on TuneIn, TuneIn's radio app worldwide, maybe on Spreaker or Mixler or their respective digital and mobile applications, or perhaps you're enjoying the show live right on our home base, thesportsfix.net, your one-stop shop for everything you need there. Make sure you bookmark it and take care of business there, thesportsfix.net. However you're enjoying the show live, thank you guys so much for being here with us. And as always, again, shout out, cannot forget the thousands of you guys that listen every day on digital delay on sites such as iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, CarPlay, all the different places that you guys listen, feed, subscribe, download the show. Thank you guys so much for doing the thing and getting your fix here with us. Speaking of getting your fix, as I say all the time, the phones are open. Use them. 216-539-7535, the number to call. 216-539-7535. Facebook, Twitter, email, always a simple 24-hour-a-day way to stay in touch. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Tweet with us at The Sports Fix. C-L-E. Email us. The Sports Fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Tweet with us at The Sports Fix. C L E. Email us. The Sports Fix at AOL.com. See here? This is a good lesson. I, I start teaching this week, you guys, at the Ohio Center for Broadcasting. I'll begin teaching some radio broadcasting to the to the next generation of guys coming through, hoping to do what we do and all of that. And here's a great lesson for them right off the bat. Week one, live radio. You never know what the hell can happen, how it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, and you just got to roll with it. And it doesn't hurt to have a bit of a technical background as well so that you can fix the problem as it's happening. Boy, I'll tell tell you what it wasn't technical it wasn't uh it wasn't anything intelligently spoken the words that were coming out of my mouth while that delay was going on i can tell you that matter of fact i was I, I i had to check because everything was frozen but the microphone was still cut on i'm like oh man what if it like caches every sound that it's heard during this delay here and then starts talking because that's happened before where uh, when things go haywire like that, it'll it'll kind of play everything that's been said in the next 30 seconds or whatever when it comes back on, and you just have to sit back and let it finish that. And boy, if that would have happened, well, it would have been a bit of a, a more entertaining beginning to the show, but it didn't, thank goodness for that here. But uh, anyways, it's a great lesson for those guys. I'm pretty excited about that, actually. I mentioned it last week. This week, Thursday, actually, I begin teaching instructing and in, our assistant instructing to start out, I should say, up at the OCB. And that's going to be really cool. Uh, I love the idea of giving back and and being a part of helping to teach. I've always had the teaching vibe in me anyway, so kind of just another place to apply that. I'm looking very forward to joining those young men and women and helping them start their journey here into broadcasting this week and uh, speaking of teaching, hey, you know, one opportunity and another all ties in. A lot of you know I've been chock full of pro wrestling gigs here uh, since I came back with my comeback here this year. And uh, many of you have gotten the chance to come out and see me this past weekend. Same thing up in Johnstown in Washington, Pennsylvania. Some great stuff going on up there. And, and shout out to all of you guys that saw me. But a lot of times it's like, hey, J-Rock, when are you coming back home, back around Cleveland? Well, you can chalk that up to this weekend for sure. I've got a, a crazy nutty travel schedule this weekend. I'm up in uh, western Pennsylvania on noon on Saturday, back down here to the Cleveland area at 6 o'clock on Saturday, back up to Erie, Pennsylvania at 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, 6 o'clock. I'm back down here in Lorain, Ohio, out on the western outskirts of Cleveland here uh, Sunday evening. So I've got a crazy back and forth, but one of them is this Saturday evening. Evening. As many of you know, I'm the radio voice for play-by-play -play basketball and football for Willoughby South. Rebels basketball, Rebels football, go Rebs, and uh, that was a great gig that I picked up last year. This year, I'm calling the kickoff of the South season. Actually, August 28th, I believe, is the first game of the schedule here for South. Looking forward to getting back out there and getting back on the radio. 1330 AM WINT calling all of the action 
Um, I'll have a few different schools, but South, I'm the primary voice. Well, I'm going to South this weekend, this Saturday, August 22nd to be specific, and I'm putting on the tights, baby, as there's a big fundraiser event for South Athletics at the school gymnasium here at Willoughby South. As you guys know, that's out in the eastern suburbs of Cleveland here. The World Heavyweight Champion of Impact Wrestling, EC3, Ethan Carter the third. Uh, in Willoughby, they know him as Michael Hutter. He has been the, a, he's Northeast Ohio's own. He's a graduate of the Rebels, and uh, he won the World Heavyweight Championship a few months ago, and he's been defending it around the world, and his tour brings him home. He will be defending that championship this Saturday at Willoughby South, and yours truly is on the other side of the ring. That's right. I called in some favors, man. I called up called up to the athletic department. I said, hey, look, man, you guys, we got a little thing going on here. Help a brother out. And indeed, they put the ink to the paper. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be myself. It'll be the world heavyweight champion, Ethan Carter the third, And by hook or crook, I'm coming out of there with that 20 pounds of gold. And I want, more importantly, each and every one of you guys to be out there and come see it because it's great. It's a fundraiser for South Athletics. It's right here in town. It's going to be a festive atmosphere until I break a bunch of Willoughby guys' hearts up. Well, I'm just telling you, I'm sending some people home sad, but you don't have to go home sad. You can come on out and have a great time this Saturday evening, Willoughby South High School at the main gymnasium. Come on out and let's get funky like a monkey, baby, at uh, at the wrestling matches. This Saturday evening, August 22nd, I look forward to seeing, I see Charles says he's there. I look forward to seeing many of you guys there this Saturday, August 22nd at Willoughby South. Also, the rest of the weekend, and I'll tell you guys more about it later. We'll, we'll get rolling here. We took too long to get the show on the air as it is, but I'm in Meadville, Pennsylvania on Saturday afternoon. I'm in Erie on se- uh, Sunday afternoon, and as I said, I'm out in Lorraine. On Sunday night, teaching at the school, got the sports fix back on the air. This is a busy, busy week. This past weekend, all over the place, uh, 700 some plus miles again in that one. Another four matches. Wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, you guys. That's for sure. Meanwhile, we're back here. We're back in the saddle talking about everything, of course. Dan Wismar is going to join me in just a few moments here. We'll talk about the Browns. We'll talk about the Indians as well. You know, the tribe, um, you know, they got things hot. And we've been out for a week, and it's a little different than when we're in here every day. We've had these little breaks and these gaps of the shows, so it kind of gives you a, a bit of a more of a bigger picture thing here. And, you know, once again, the Indians, you talked about them getting a little warm after the <laughs> Mike Brandenberry texting me and says, oh, you foolish young man. When I said, hey, look at this, four in a row. Oh, man, maybe they uh maybe they're gonna get kick started here, at least get them back to five hundred. But even when they go on these little runs, look at it. We've been out for a week, and when we were here a week ago, they were eight games back from uh five hundred and looking to work their way back up there. And even after a little winning streak and they get warmed up by the time they play fifty fifty back and forth, guess what? The last ten games they're five and five. We come back here a week later, they're still eight games back from five hundred and so on and so forth. So it's it's the one thing about baseball is that it's impossible to look at it in the small term because you have to look at it in the bigger picture because at the end of the day, you're continuing to tread water, continuing to tread water. At this point, I continue to have hopes that they can get to 500 by the end of the season. I want to see some things for next year. I want to see them, you know, show, look, what you got, figure it out so we can get moving because there's no way that the fans, that the players, that anybody involved with the Indians, fans of baseball, Indians baseball, any of that should have to go through another season of of this figuring it out, adjusting, transitioning, all of that. Um, I know it's much tougher what the Indians are going to have to try to do here, transitioning on the fly uh, without totally tearing it down. And I don't, I don't, I don't advocate that they do. I mean, hey, I believe that they've got a uh, just with the pitching because I'm not even going to get into what you think of certain selections of the core players that term with the uh, with the individual players offensively. But the core pitching that they've got locked up, man, how about Carlos Carrasco just continuing to absolutely tear it up? Many of them. And we're going to get into that. Corey Kluber, they're teasing with that no hitter. again. They keep 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 dancing all the way around it. I'll, I'll talk about that more when Dan gets on here, too, because he called it in spring training that somebody's throwing a no-no and they've done everything but get it just 
get it done there, man, as they came close again here uh, over the weekend. Kluber had that one hitter going, and we're going to talk about all that. Matter of fact, let me get to a break, and let's get my man, Dan Wismar, in on the conversation here. Talk some Browns, talk some Buckeyes, camps kicking off for them, Indians and more. Dan Wismar, always one of my favorite conversations of the week. Man, so much that we blew past here. I didn't even... Uh, begin to plug the you know we'll talk about it a little bit later uh, I have four or five open slots for the sports fix fantasy football league I want to talk to you guys a little bit De- of course BJ Riddell going to join us in the first segment of fantasy football for winners this Wednesday so we'll talk about that more if you're interested in playing fantasy football it's free and there's a championship belt on the line for the winner if you're interested send us a message hit us up on the social media i'll talk to you more about that in a little bit but next coming up after the news i'm going to talk to dan wismar from the cleveland fan from everybody hates cleveland it was a rocky start to today's show but we're going to Kick it up a notch next when Dan joins us. I promise we're diving into some Brown, some Buckeyes, some Tribe, and so much more. Guys, sit tight. Enjoy the news. Catch yourself up when we come back. My man, the man, Dan Wismar, joins us next here from Everybody Hates Cleveland. We'll be right back after the news here on the Sports Fix. Get You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into... The Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd it's an addiction the sports fix will be right back how to be a great dad in 15 seconds Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. real. And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. There's literally only one place to go. FantasyJocks.com Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Signs and Ship, the official printing source of the Sports Fix. Locations in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida. Find out more at SignsAndShip.com News break. I'm Christine Lisi. Right now, ESPN's Ed Werder reporting a new detail in the four-year, $83 million extension quarterback Philip Rivers signed with the Chargers has a no-trade clause that significantly increases the chance the 33-year-old will spend his entire career with the franchise. Buccaneers right tackle DeMar Dotson will miss six weeks because of a sprained MCL, reports the NFL Network. He was hurt in the second quarter in Saturday's preseason opener. 
Cowboys first round pick Byron Jones injured his shoulder at practice. He'll likely miss a couple of days of training camp. In light of the Redskins Texans brawl in joint practice last weekend and the NFL warning teams about fighting during games, the Dolphins and Panthers will enforce the no fighting rule in their joint practices on Wednesday and Thursday. USC freshman QB Ricky Town transferring. Town, a touted recruit from Ventura County, faced stiff competition for playing time at Southern Cal. Cody Kessler is heading into his third year as a starter for the Trojans. Backup Max Brown, freshman Sam Darnold are also elite prospects. Baseball, Royals outfielder Alex Gordon, sidelined by a strained groin, will start a rehab assignment, could be back by the end of the month. Head to Subway to start your day the flavorful way by adding new guacamole to your favorite breakfast sandwich. Perfectly made from Haas avocados with a hint of jalapeno. Our guacamole turns up the flavor to your breakfast. Try it today on a hot and toasty bacon, egg, and cheese. Subway, eat fresh. Hey everybody, this is Jerry the King Lawler from WWE, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live. J-Rock back with you here, and I think we've got control of this vessel now. You know what? Talk about irony sometimes. You know that right before we came back, Jerry Lawler there? Um, Let me just say the old expression, the apple does or doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, let me just tell you, over the weekend, one apple I experienced fell really far from the tree because Jerry Lawler... Always uh, one of the uh, classier guys I've dealt with. And hey, listen, I know some people have had different business relationships with him. But in general, Jerry Lawler, a very professional, a very, uh, very classy guy in the most part. And uh, let me just tell you that the apple fell very far from the tree when it comes to his son, Brian, who I had the unfortunate experience of uh, not only working with this weekend, but babysitting uh, through his uh, drug-induced tour of Pennsylvania. And, hey, I apologize if that sounds uh, harsh, but the truth often is. And, unfortunately, uh, he ain't no king. Let me just put it to you that way. And uh, it is what it is because, unfortunately, when you when you uh, when you travel and when you experience any line of work, there's the good, there's the bad, there's the ugly, and uh, two of those three words apply to the son of Jerry the King Lawler, and uh, the one that doesn't is the first one. So you guys can say what you want, do what you want with that. I will say this: uh, there was all kinds of interesting things out of this weekend, and I'm not going far with this, but one of them was. Uh, Five years to the day, pretty much, after the entire world saw a very uh, uh, ugly incident between myself and Jake the Snake Roberts, who back at that time in his life was also going through a very difficult time with substance abuse and drugs and alcohol. And unfortunately, they say sometimes your worst moments are captured for the world to be seen. Well, that one was definitely one of his. And my reaction to it was one of my worst moments for sure. And uh, it was shown to millions of people around the world. And for five years, I've had to carry the weight of that thing around and just wish it would have never happened. And I did get a chance. Uh, all right. Quick, 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 quick story from the weekend. Friday, went and uh, had a, a little awkward interaction with Jake Roberts and um, you could tell there was something there, but I didn't know. And when we left. I talked to the promoter and he said, you know what, do you think that uh, he didn't realize who you were, perhaps because you've lost so much weight? Because as you guys know, I've lost nearly 100 pounds in the last year or over 100 pounds. So we were joking about that on Friday night. We get to the arena on Saturday and Jake's daughter, who travels with him, comes up to me and she goes, we figured out who you are. And I go, oh, who am I? And she goes. You're the guy from TMZ, and you're the guy that came down and filmed part of the movie about my dad. And I said, yes, I am. I said, I wasn't sure if you guys realized it yesterday or not. And so anyways, uh, to cut all the, the ins and outs out, you know, we had a very good conversation on Saturday. 
and um, then went out there and did some work on Saturday evening. So uh, it was it was a good deal, and I was glad. To, hey, look, man, everybody's got to live their own life. They have to answer for their own things, and uh, Jake Roberts has, has got many of his own battles to fight, but uh, we had a good conversation, and the past is the past, baby. You cannot carry that. You can't carry stuff around with you because all it does is weigh you down, not them, and I was very glad to get that out of my life and get that mess out of my face. And I wish Jake the the very best in his life going forward. But uh, how ironic that as I'm as I'm getting closure on one horrible incident like that, here comes another goofball with his addiction problems. And but anyways, uh, I'm just y'all ever watch South Park? Drugs are bad. Okay, you know. And uh, and while I say that, let me remind you that. 90% of the people that I work with in this business are incredible people. And I refer to radio or wrestling, not radio. Incredible people. Great, great human beings. And then, and then there's that 10%. So anyways, uh, off on that a little bit. I'll talk to you guys some more. Maybe I'll tell some more funny stories that came out of this weekend. Don't even ask me about Scotty Too Hottie over there. Let me tell you something. There's another one that I could have a few words about here on the radio, but I'd be wasting my airtime on people that aren't worth it. Instead, I'm going to give that airtime to my man, Dan Wismar, of course. Can't wait to get Dan back in here. It's been a week since we've caught up. Dan the man from the Cleveland fan from EverybodyHatesCleveland.com here on the Sports Fix as we're getting ready to talk some tribes, some Browns, some Buckeyes, and whatever else Dan wants to, baby. Dan, my man, how you doing this Monday afternoon? I'm uh, doing great, Jerry. Good to be back with you. It's uh, I guess it's officially football season now that we've got a uh, exhibition game under our belt and we got the Buckeyes in camp. So uh, uh, can't be more excited uh, because uh, it finally is here again. Yes, it actually actually is, and so are you here again. And I'll tell you, Dan, we were we were we were on the verge of this not happening until Wednesday. I, I was getting ready to text you at the beginning of the show and go, you know what? This is a sign here. This is a sign from whoever you want to believe puts up signs for us, brother, because it was a, a battle to get us on the air here this morning. But we were able to get yeah, it Yeah, I, I found that out, Jerry, when I when I logged on my computer, and it was uh, 13 minutes after 12, and I saw I'd only been on the air for five minutes. So, That's you know, it? I knew something. I knew some gremlins were uh, were bothering you here. I mean, it was amazing. It just, the, the literally, the computer just crashes 10 minutes before the show, and I'm like, well, 10 minutes. Maybe we can make it on air. 25 minutes later, we get this thing on the air. I said, well, I didn't even say anything bad about Nick Swisher, but I'll make sure I get a few in just to make it worth it here before I'm done, you know? Anyways. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in fact, speaking of that, um, might as well go there first. I I, I, read in, I read in Pluto's article this morning that uh, going into the weekend, Nick Swisher and Michael Bourne were combined two for 30. and uh, with, The two the came on the so first I, day. Didn't the two I, I come on to, the first I, I day? Wanted to check and, I wanted to check and see how, how they did over the weekend. They went to combine two for 11 over the weekend. Swisher did have a two-run homer. So that, that would make him, by my rough math, about four for 41 or slightly under a 100 batting average. So I, I just, just for those people that are keeping track of those sorts of things, uh, I just thought that would be a little little trivia update for you. I'm just going to tell you, Nick Swisher, if you're the one messing with our little radio show, that's what you need to be worried about right there. I, didn't the two come on the first day, Dan? I didn't Swisher have two hits in his first day with with Atlanta? I, I think. think he he might have, he might have, but uh, I, I know that over the weekend they got one hit a piece. So they're and they're not playing every day, of course. Down there, they're. I don't think he's got them both in the lineup on any given day, but. I uh, hope not. You know, I, all I can say is John Hart must have been. I, I read how desperate he was to get rid of Chris Johnson. He must have been really, really desperate. You know what? I'm glad you went there. Joking aside with what you said there, Chris Johnson, because, you know, it is what it is. Babraham El Monte, you know, everybody can have fun early when a guy gets going and, and you wait and see <laughs> a little bit. But, you know, and I don't know statistically uh, what he did the last few games before. Of course, he got bit by a spider here over the weekend, which is always scary right. stuff there. But, you know, he was playing some pretty decent ball coming over, at least at the beginning part after the travel. If he threw his first, what, 15, 20 at-bats, he was around 500 or something like that. And uh, I, I looked at my son the first couple of games after he came back. He was stroking pretty well, and I said, well, you know, 
Ah, um, fresh, fresh coat of paint, maybe, you know, but a lot of times a guy is what he is. But as he kept getting a few hits here and there, I'm going, I don't know. Did he just hate things in Atlanta so bad that things went south? I mean, what do you think? Because you and I mentioned when they traded for him that most people wrote him off as a bad contract that the Indians had to take on. And he does strike out a small village, but he's 30 years old. He's still in his athletic prime and he does have the ability to hit 300 or at least he did and to drive in some runs. So, I mean, do you have maybe a little curiosity that can Chris Johnson be like, not just a a big contract they had to take, but some kind of a contributor in the next year for this team? Well, yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, seems like the only reason that they made that deal was because Hart wanted to be done with the big money contracts by the end of next year, mm-hmm. and, and Chris Johnson, uh, I understand, has uh, is owed nine million for for 2017. So, and that's a commitment that the Indians were willing to take on. But you know, yeah, I think he's got a track record of being a uh, you know, it's it's not Albert Pujols, but it's uh, you know, twelve to fifteen homers, sixty five to seventy RBIs. You know, you'll you'll take that from a guy who, who's you know got some pop and a right handed bat and. Uh, you know, can play a couple different positions for you. So, sure, I, I think he's got a chance to be a contributor. I, he went seven of his first nine there, I think, with with the Indians, and including, I think, four yeah. hits of the first day a game I happened to be at. But um, so, you know, hopes were uh, elevated then, and he's cooled off quite a bit since then. But yeah, I think he's got a chance to help the team. And I, you know, we everybody was looking at it as addition by subtraction, uh, just to get rid of the other two guys. Uh, so it's almost like anything he gives you as a bonus. Uh, and, and if there's a downside, it's that you're committed to him uh, or his contract through uh, through the year after next. Oh, absolutely. Well, just for those of you wondering here, since he's come over to the Indians, and I mean, we're talking about 21 plate appearances, but he is 9 for 21 since he came over, 429 average. He's got three doubles. He's got three strikeouts. So, uh, there you go. He hasn't he hasn't struck out at anywhere near the rate he had previously. But again, we're talking about twenty one at bats. But still, it just it intrigues me enough to wonder if perhaps you know because sometimes a fresh slate does help a guy out, and sometimes they go four for forty once they get traded, as we've seen down in Atlanta. So you know, I mean, I at least have a, a curiosity as to where perhaps, you know, he can go if he can actually be a contributor or if he was just the cost of doing business. Yeah, and, um, you know, I just think the chemistry, it seems to be better since those guys are gone. And no Chris doubt. Johnson or no Chris Johnson, uh, I tell you, the guy that's just been on fire is Lindor. Of course, he's been hitting three fifty five yeah. since the All-Star break. Uh, he got his batting average up to two ninety. 92, I think, as of this morning, uh, just giving you way more than you thought you could possibly get out of a guy in his first taste of big league play. And, and just as exciting that he's 21 years old and uh, we haven't even scratched the surface yet of what he can be. So, and, and every, every, it seems like every game or every other game, he's making a play, a shortstop that's just a wild, a wild play. Uh, you know, uh, did it over the weekend, uh, yes. dive into his right to start a double play. And, uh, just he, he gives you that every once in a while, and of course, Urshela has been giving you some wild plays over at third base too. Although he's hitting 60 points less, um, he he seems to be uh, swinging a lot of balls off the off the outside corner. Uh, he he can't lay off that that pitch off the plate outside, and until he learns to lay off it, he's gonna he's gonna get a steady diet of that stuff. But just one thing I've noticed about about him and his his hitting at the plate, but. Uh, you know, it's just uh, it's encouraging to just see that defense. We haven't seen defense like that on the left side of the infield for a long time since oh, the, the late nine since the late nineties. Let's say no doubt, no doubt, absolutely. I mean, these guys have have jacked it up. Of course, some of the uh, some of the defensive metrics people will go out there and, and jump on it too. But I mean, the Indians have. Uh, have definitely been better, and it's it's such a glimpse into the future, too. As you said, offensively, you know, Urshela's got to show what he can do there, but, man, Lindor's really starting to get comfortable, I think, up at this level. Uh, with the glove, they're giving you some incredible plays on, on a nightly basis, and it is definitely 
uh, continues to fuel the juice. And that's why the little bit, again, the show at the beginning got all screwed up. So everything that I wanted to talk about got thrown out the window and I was just happy to be on the air. But the little bit I was talking about the Indians, that to me is the trick here in what they're what they need to try to do from this season to next because there's no way i don't care what optimism may come out of the end of this season or whatever you're not selling this fan base that's already at its wits end with things on any more patience and i'm not saying you go break the bank because that doesn't happen but they're not going to buy a a, we've got to rebuild this thing for another year and figure out what we've got i think that's what the rest of this year has to be and then you've got to transition you've got to not completely tear it down you've got to figure out how to rebuild around what you've got and keep it moving forward because otherwise i don't know that you can that you can i don't know what you can do next season otherwise you can't take these fans into another season of well we think we got it but we got to figure some things out this year's eh, more about figuring some stuff out yeah well the other thing too is as you look to the future and you know we so often get hung up on the future because the present isn't always pleasant, but uh, two, like two first round, two first round picks for the Indians uh, look like they're, you know, are having big time second halves. I'm talking about Clint Frazier and Bradley Zimmer. I mean, yeah, uh, those, those two guys look like they're going to be up in the major league sooner as opposed to later. Now Zimmer is 22 years old, a college player. So he's probably closer. He's up at Akron having a big second half, but Clint Frazier too, down in, at high A has been, uh, tearing it up. He's been player of the week a couple weeks in a row, player of the month at the Eastern League. And, um, you know, he's starting to find the power stroke, and, and you just kind of envision him in right field in a year or two, and you envision Bradley Zimmer in center field along with Brantley and left, and all of a sudden you've got a, uh, a pretty good looking young outfield, and, uh, you know, you need to you need to resolve a situation at first base and get some, get some pop in, in that position, but, um, uh, However, the the future you know looks at first base. Uh, that outfield with those two kids uh, coming up fast and strong uh, looks very promising. So, again, it's just uh, you, you, I'm following those guys. I'm following the the, the high minors prospects, and and uh, you know they've managed to go through the season keeping the starting pitching core in place. And obviously, you never know what's going to happen year to year, even with four or five starting pitchers that you think are. Or, or pure gold, uh, you know, things can happen, injuries happen, and guys have down years, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the, at the thing long-term, uh, and, uh, you know, I, you know, you know me, I'll still be interested. I'll still be watching just about every Indians game the rest of the way, um, because you got to see how they're going to deal with it and how this chemistry is going to form. And I, I just, uh, you know, with the pitching and with Lindor and with some of the other guys that, uh, that are just fun to watch every day. Uh, you know, this team can be out of it. They still got my attention. I agree. I mean, they've definitely, again, played better. That that was the frustrating thing, as I mentioned. Going a week since we were on the air last, you know, you saw kind of a, a perfect glimpse. They had a little winning streak going, then a little bit of up and down, and even though they're playing better, they come out of the last 10 games 5-5, five and five, just kind of sitting around 500. They can't get too far out ahead of themselves and as we know the hole they've dug is is so deep that you you can't even look at that realistically for this season but you have to answer some questions and i'm with you i think zimmer obviously they they're very patient and to the point that they frustrated the fan base with lindor here but um I definitely think he has a chance to be at least in the mix of things coming into next season, whether he's ready for it or not, will determine that. But I'm with you. I think that, you know, they may not be, uh, you know, perfect here with the way they've drafted over the years, but they've gotten better. And it seems like the main ones anyway, at least uh, they look like they may have hit on a few here. And if one or two of those guys, like you said, though, you know, Frazier and, and Zimmer, they, then you add that and, and they hit on two or three or maybe four of these guys. That's what you that that's what you really need. Obviously, you'd like to have, you know, 20 pieces of your roster coming up through the farm system. But if you can get 
three or four key ones, big ones, and mix that into the guys that you've got. I mean, that'll make a big difference. You've got those guys. And then you've got the question mark, as you mentioned over there at first. I mean, now, now you do have an option. I mean, hey, if the Indians were to entertain something with Carlos Santana over the winter, as so many people seem to want or maybe even expect them to do, I mean, perhaps Chris Johnson's at least a one-season viable backup or, or backup plan, I should say. To, to plug in over there too. That was kind of what was intriguing to me about him coming over too, was that he opened up kind of that option there too. So they, they're at least a lot more, I don't know if I want to use the word flexible, but they've got much more, uh, I think variability to which way they can go here heading into the off season. Yeah, that's true. And if you want to project a couple of years, it looks like they may have hit on a, on another high pick is Bobby Bradley, uh, uh, looks like a big time stick. Uh, some of the best power in the in the low minors uh, anywhere. Uh, first baseman that they that they got in last year's draft and tore up the Arizona Fall League and and then uh, is now in a ball. Uh, you know, hitting the cover off the ball. So he, there's a first base prospect that maybe uh, you know he's young and he was a high school player, but uh, you know a couple years away maybe from uh, from looking at Bobby Bradley over at first base. Anyway. There you go, it's, uh, man. You know, to me, the exciting thing right now, Jerry, is is looking at uh, the teams that are coming up, and they're looking like you know this year's playoffs look to be real fun. I'm I'm kind of hoping for the Nationals and the Giants to to stay right where they are, just outside the wild card race. Uh, I would love to see us go into this playoff with the Mets and the Cubs and the Pirates all in it. That would that would be so much fun in the postseason in the National League, and and the American League obviously has some great teams too that are gonna going to make it fun i saw you know t- toronto's in there How about uh, toronto they're another, eight another, and two another, another fresh face for the playoffs i just think all the fresh faces in the playoffs are going to make it really really fun this fall yeah that's you just mentioned toronto i didn't mean to, to step on you there at the end they're eight and two in their last 10 and really getting themselves hot that's what a team does when they're trying to to get into the playoffs there at the end they don't play 500 they don't win four lose three win you know they they get on a run of eight of ten nine of ten like the cubs didn't they that was their their first what did they i think the, the cubs last... are on a run of six straight right now well yeah but they're um, they're like 20 yeah, and, uh, and, and toronto toronto lost 20 two and nine the yankees that's their two losses they were on a nine straight thing before right. they uh went went into new york for the weekend but uh and they dropped two Since... out of three and just just won the the last game yesterday but yeah uh they look great, and, and they, they just score runs in bunches, and, and they've been getting good pitching too. So I just, um, you know, I, I'm just hoping that some of those old old guys, I'm tired of the San Francisco Giants. I hope they finish out of the playoffs. I like um, the Giants, but I'm but with it, you. Oh, well, I'm, you I'm, know, I'm... you like them, but, you know, four out of, what, four out of six <laughs> World Series? Let, let's, let's, get some, let's get some fresh blood in there. Let's get some Midwestern uh, Pirates, Cubs, and, uh, and you know those what, guys though? in there. Giants aren't cooperating but, uh, with you. They're the fourth best team since the All Star break. They're uh, 19 yeah. Oh yeah, they've been playing real the well. And that's, uh, I'm just like I said. I, I'd like. I'd rather see the uh, those three central teams: Cardinals, Pirates, and Cubs in there. That would be uh, that would be great to have some Midwest baseball in the uh, in the fall classic. And I love the Cards too. They're, actually, that's funny. Those are the three of the four hottest teams since the break: the Blue Jays, the Cubs, the Cards, and the Giants have the four best records. Uh, in baseball since they've left the all-star break there and i'm with you and those are all great stories i mean obviously the cubbies you know that would be a a heck of one there so i and i do i get into that getting some fresh faces out there too and stuff i've just i've always had a spot the giants the cardinals two of the teams that uh, over in the national league that i've always got a ton of respect for and and seeing that but it's going to be fun going to be some fun stretch races there you know especially if you don't have one to watch here in cleveland as it is and of course that helps people just transition right on into football season anyway but before we get off the indians i want to go back real quick and talk a little bit about the pitching my man we've mentioned how great it is but you know here they go again keep dancing around kluber Dancing around the no hitter, you know, just dominant the other day. Carrasco, Carrasco's last four starts has given up like five earned runs. He's got about thirty strikeouts. I mean, he just continues to to sizzle along here. But they keep teasing. Are they going to get this no no before the thing's over? Because they've done everything but throw the no hitter this season, man. You know, I uh, I'm going to stick with my prediction. I think you know. I- I've been bouncing around. I said at the beginning of the year, I thought maybe Bauer had the best shot at it, but now 
I tell you, I think either Carrasco or Salazar might have the best shot at it. And Kluber, of course, you know, he, he he's teased you three or four times this year. I think <laughs> I heard five times he's gone through five innings. Yeah. And I think twice he's gone into the seventh inning. Carrasco, of course, went all the way to the ninth inning. I, uh, Anderson went to the seventh inning the one time. So, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, you know, teased us with it, tantalized us. And, uh, I still think it's going to happen just because you've got no hit stuff going out there, you know, four, four games out of five. And, um, you know, I, I think we're going to get it. I was at that game a week ago Sunday when Kluber went into the seventh and, and Maurer got the base hit. Uh, and of course that and Kluber came back and one hit the twins again a week later. Um, and uh, so they're just they're tired of seeing him, but um, yeah, I still think it's going to happen, Jerry. I, I'm going to stick with my prediction, and uh, I think right now, you know, Carrasco or Salazar probably might be the best bets to do it, even though obviously you can't rule out Kluber. I'm telling you, Dan. I know that that the hardcore Tribe fans don't want to hear this right now, or maybe the casual fans don't want to hear anything about the future or even next year. But when you look at the strength of this pitching and how good, not just good, good is not the right word, but this level of pitching and then the excitement when we look at talking just what we said earlier about Lindor and how he play, how he's played in the field, the glove work, some of the to me. All the pieces are there if you, again, this is the big if, add the right, whatever the, the, the thing is offensively that you need to do to, to put enough juice in this lineup because the, all the pieces are there for one of the most exciting teams in baseball as far as having young players that are exuberant and and, and all all just jacked up and making sweet plays in the field and great pitching, just going out there every night with a chance to, to shut the other team down. And, and I mean, all the pieces are there for the Indians to put together a hell of a baseball team here, man. Oh yeah, you're right. And, and, you know, this is a team that, uh, you know, slot, uh, slot Brady Aiken into that fifth starter spot here in a year or two. You know, obviously you're hoping he comes back from the uh, from the Tommy John surgery uh, healthy, but this was the number one player in the draft a year ago, and and the tribe went and picked him up, and, and with their late late pick this year, uh, he's a guy, a left-handed starter who who can come in in a couple of years, hopefully, and uh, and be another stud in that rotation, and uh, they've got other other you know good-looking young arms too, so. The pitching gravy train isn't going to stop. Uh, so it, you're right, though. Uh, there's a core here. There's two or three holes to fill in that in that core position players. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the future's bright. And you know, we we can sometimes get uh, ahead of ourselves on that. Sometimes it's good to you know, tap the brakes. But you're right. There's there's an exciting thing here that that can happen. And you know, we get frustrated with our front office, but. Uh, they have uh, drafted better in the last few years, and, and it's not on the distant horizon where this team has a real shot at contention, but it's on the near horizon, I think. No, I agree. I've been telling people, and I'll say this here on the air, that I honestly think that a lot of people will sleep on the Tribe maybe heading into next season because of this season and them not living up to the expectations. And I'm talking about in the media and, and all of that. And that's exactly what I hope for, because I think that next year with the right, just two or three moves here in the off season, and I'm not even talking about spending a billion dollars, just the right two or three moves here in the off season next season, these Indians can quietly be the team that everybody maybe had expectations or hopes of them being this year. And that I hope at least is the way things play out. Well, yeah, from your lips to God's ears, man. Uh, you know, hey, there that, you that's, go. Uh, uh, that's, that's what we're all counting on because it's been so frustrating. I mean, the first half of the season was, you know, just painful, gut-wrenching, awful. You know, it seems like every night because the team was just not playing well, not playing fundamentally well, certainly not playing, you know, good defense. And uh, and the situational hitting was like the opposite. Couldn't win at home. I mean, you you we you went through it. I don't need to tell you. It, it was gut wrenching oh, yeah. all the time. Uh, we we couldn't even believe it. We're pinching ourselves because we couldn't believe how bad it was. Um, it, it, it you know it, if anything, it can't be that bad again. You know the the fates, the circumstances just aren't going to play out the same way. And, and and we had several guys obviously that were playing under under their potential um, in the early part of the season. And 
Uh, a couple guys just needed to be replaced, and we've done that. So, yeah, I'm I'm always uh, a glass half full guy, but I'm sincerely optimistic about uh, the short term future. Like, like you say, given their ability to to make a move, plug a hole here or there, and and uh, build a bench, uh, I think the bench is going to be significantly different next year. I don't know that Michael Veals will be around. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Jose Ramirez kind of takes over his job. Um, or some combination of Ramirez and someone else, but you know it's, um, uh, I, you know, like you say, the the, the future is promising, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bank it on next season, and, and you know, echo that that Cleveland mantra. Wait till next year. Oh no, I knew you were gonna say that. As soon as, <laughs> I knew that's what you were gonna say, but that's why, even though it's very easy, and I know many of you out there are like, yeah, yeah, let's talk some football. I will still be watching the Indians the rest of the way through because I want to know heading into this off season whether we're right or because you'll know and you'll be able to go, nah, you know what? But I got a feeling that. Uh, that we're right. So you definitely don't want to just flip the switch, but we will flip the switch now as we flip over, by the way, conveniently into the next hour of the show. Welcome into the sports fix. J rock here talking with Dan Wismar. Everybody hates Cleveland. And we're talking, we were talking some tribe. Let's talk a little bit of football Browns and Buckeyes, both now in full swing as far as preparing for their seasons. Let's talk about the Browns. I mean, last week they were getting ready for the first preseason game and it becomes at least a little bit easier to talk about things because we've got some things to evaluate for whatever it's worth. But first game in the books, I mean, before we even talk specifics, what did you come out of the first preseason game with? Well, I think it's going to be tough for this team to score points. We knew that. This is not a, this is not a news flash. Uh, but, you know, when you look at how they score, you know, the team obviously went to the went to halftime, you know, when the starters and the twos were playing, the Browns were up 14, 13 at the half. They they held their own. But if you if you really look at how they scored, they you know, the first yeah. touchdown was scored on the, with the help of a 40-yard pass interference penalty. And the second touchdown was scored with the help of a special teams turnover on a fumbled punt return uh, that, that put them in field position. So they, they didn't have a sustained drive all the time during the entire first half, even though both McCown and, and Manziel, you know, look decent. And, and you can see that this is going to be a dink and dunk, a short possession passing game, at least by, by the indications of the first game, that this is what DeFlippo is going to do. He's going to have McCown, you know, making high percentage throws and he's got some sure handed guys. And I liked, especially when they were down in the red zone on the, on the McCown drive, how they were going into the middle for, you know, to pick up four or five yards on a quick quick slant to Hartline or a quick hitter to Gabriel or, or you know, those plays when they were down in tight and yet they were still throwing the ball, uh, or maybe they might be expected to run it. And McCown is able to – he's tall enough to get it over the on-rushing lineman. He's able to, you know, get rid of the ball quickly, hit those guys, get first downs, move the chain. So that was encouraging to me. Uh, several of the player performances were very encouraging to me, uh, mostly on the defensive side, though, I got to say. Um, you know, I think people are going to love Brian Hartline, but, you know, on the defensive side, I, I just love this draft area more and more as I see that some of the draft choices play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first, first of all, Danny Shelton, I think, is the real deal. I, uh, yeah, he there is. There were some people that were kind of knocking him after the game, but I thought, man, were you were you even watching? Um uh, People complaining about the run defense, and maybe it wasn't. They broke off a couple of long runs, but I went through this morning just preparing to be on here with you to talk about this this run defense thing, and I went through the the first half run defense, the rushing plays for the Redskins, zero five five three three two five four. They had an 18 yard run. Finally, they broke one off, and then a four yard run minus one three four. They were not ripping off long rushing games against the Browns' defense in the first half. Or even it was even better in the second half, even though they gave up a 23-yarder in the second half, where the guy kind of spun outside, kept his balance, and then kind of got to the outside and rambled for 20 yards. But then it seemed like two zero four three two three one five. You know, they, you know, it, it's not like the uh, the Redskins were were ripping the Browns' defense up on in the rushing game. Um, so I was encouraged by that. I was encouraged by Shelton. Uh, I loved, um, uh, I thought the guy that might've had one of the better games was Ibrahim Campbell, yeah. uh, the, the, the safety from Northwestern number 30. He, he, I think he had five tackles in the game and he hits like, uh, 
like a linebacker. Um, I was real impressed with him and his first ever NFL action uh, really jumped out at me. And, uh, and, and Hayes Bullard, you know, looked good on, on a handful of plays, uh, mostly in the fourth quarter, the linebacker from USC. So, he, you know, those draft choices, Taylor Maley, I thought acquitted himself well. He had a, a, a ball bounce off his hands for an interception late in the game that probably was thrown too high. Maybe you should have had it, but that was the only knock on him. He had two or three catches. Bibbs looked good. So uh, there was a lot of in, encouraging individual performances like that. Um, of course, Xavier Cooper had the sack. So lots of the draft choices, I thought, showed up and played well, uh, and that to me is encouraging as anything. I agree, especially on the defensive side. I guess, all right, let's see. Let's start with the quarterback since you started there. And uh, I'm probably not going to make a lot of people happy with what I say here, but I've got to be honest with you. I expect the Browns quarterback play to be pretty pretty bad this season in general uh, based on what I saw, and I'll tell you why. It was because of exactly what you said. The only things that I really saw, and again, this is – preseason and and that's part of the reason that I have the bad feeling that I do because against very generic defenses very vanilla defenses very first preseason game defenses I watch these quarterbacks only complete passes to their first read most of the time many of them on as you said designed quick four yard slants get the ball out real fast and do that the touchdown that McCown got there's not a chance in hell that that play is successful in the regular season against any team that's trying Josh McCown is not going all the way to the left who then sprinting back out to the middle of the field and finding missing two wide open guys and then finding a third wide open guy in the end zone that's one of the things that I noticed on that play was that he missed the first two guys that were open on the play before he found the wide open guy in the back corner that play doesn't happen in the regular season matter of fact I don't think that play happens in week three of the preseason to be honest with you uh, same thing with Manziel's run that rush doesn't happen in the in the regular season at all no defense turns every back to the, it, they basically just had no no care whether Manziel was going to run or not every defender turned their back to the play and went off and did their thing and if he hadn't ran that ball I'd have been even more concerned about Johnny Manziel because that was and I don't think that was I don't even know if that was designed or not or whatever but that again does not come close to happening in the regular season and I just worry that what we're looking at is an offense that is going to have incredible problems moving the chains they're going to end up with a lot of four yard pass four yard pass third and two and whether they can run for that first down or not is going to determine whether they go three and out or whether they're able to extend a lot of these drives I'm just I'm just more convinced than I was before that either one of these quarterbacks, and I, I don't know, a lot of people are, hey, Johnny is a new guy. He may be a new guy, but to me, he's the same football player that we thought he was, as is Josh McCown. Can this coaching staff make them adequate, protect their weaknesses? That's going to be the key. But I just see, Dan, I see when this regular season, look, I see what happened to Hoyer happening Again and worse with these either one of these quarterbacks, whichever one's your guy, because the minute these defenses are playing for real and they lock down on these wide receivers, I don't see a wide receiver on the Browns with the ability to go down the field and break open on a route, and it's going to be all three, four, five-yard, one-read, quick slants, and that's going to be the main thrust of what this offense can do in the passing game because I just... I'm not confident at all, and I think that the success that they did have, not a chance in the world it happens in the regular season. Well, yeah, and, and like I said, I, I and my, my first point was it's going to be hard for this offense to score. Very hard. It's, just, it's going to be, you know, and people were people were dismayed at the, first of all, the Browns didn't attempt to run the ball that much, I think. No. In the first half, Crowell and West had, I think, eight carries total, and they had 16 yards, and five of them came on, on, uh, on one carry by Crowell. But uh, so yeah, they they didn't really even try to do that very much. But still, uh, that's what we can expect for 16 games. Teams loading up. They know the Browns want to run the ball, and we're going to take that away. And we're going to dare Josh McCown to beat us throwing the ball. We're going to even dare even more to beat us throwing the ball more than 10 yards down the field. Uh, that's what we can expect. If we have to be able to prove that we can do that. Uh, 
and uh, until we do, it's going to be tough to run the ball because that's what teams are going to load up to stop. So we I were saying Hartline. this exact same thing a year ago, Jerry. We were saying we were saying sure. it, uh, that, that we would have to, you know, we were hoping that play action and other trickery, tomfoolery, or whatever we could come up with was going to was going to generate some some passing offense for this team. But we we had a hard time seeing where it was going to come from. And frankly, in the first uh, half of the season last year. Some of us were dumbfounded. They were actually having some success. We saw receivers running open for for Brian Hoyer on play action. We saw a lot of a lot of open Taylor Gabriel down the field, and, and you know some some Travis Benjamin plays that were. You know, we couldn't believe that teams were actually letting guys get that wide open. Um, it's the same story this year. It really is. Uh, McCown will have to prove it, and and uh, maybe when they get Dwayne Bow and and Hartline and Gabriel and Hawkins and everybody out there that uh, they've got a plan cooked up to uh, to throw the ball down the football field. But I think maybe what we saw Thursday is going to be the plan, and that is dink, dunk, move the chains, uh, possession, intermediate, count on McCown's accuracy rather than his, uh, uh, you know, big arm the to, to, uh, this team, man. To, to, you know, move the ball, score points. It's going to be forced turnovers and short fields and try to take advantage, and, and that's going to be the key to how many games this team's able to win because I'm with you. Offensively, they'll they'll do a few things, but they're going to be they're going to be limited. And, and Bo, I'm very curious because, to me, he is the, the one chance to, to be somewhat of a, of a downfield threat for them, but I wonder – how much I know he'll be a red zone threat because he can still jump and go up and get a high pass. But how much speed does he have? Can he get downfield? Can he get open? Can he help the Browns throw a pass that's longer than than ten yards in its intended dip distance? Because if they can, then that'll open things up a little bit. If not, it's going to be a lot. Hey, Brian Hartline is the man. He'll go across the middle. He's going to convert a lot of first downs for this team, which is something you and I talked about when everybody yawned at Hartline. I'm like, man, I'll take Brian Hartline because. We don't know where the first down marker is for the last 10 years. We can never, if it's third and nine, we're throwing a seven yard pass all day long. And at least Brian Hartline knows where the sticks are and he'll get some first downs when you need them there as far as that. But it's going to take more than that because eventually teams, they'll give you a little bit of that until they take it away. And then what else are you going to do? That is, is going to be the key defensively. And that's where I come back to what I said at the beginning, the way the Browns can win a lot of games this year is going to be on that side of the ball, not just dominating the other team, which is, we'll see how strong they can be there, but getting those turnovers, they, they, they showed some of that last year, some of it in the first preseason game, short fields, causing disruptions in the defense and the return game a little bit as we saw with Justin Gilbert breaking one there but that's going to be the key because I think I'm with you I think the run run defense I still want to you know obviously see more but I was a bit impressed with what I saw uh, all over the place defensively those young guys they're all going to make this roster everybody that they drafted in the last two years is going to be on this roster it is a completely different defensive lineup than it was two years ago and I really do I'm encouraged by what this defense can do here I think practicing all week against uh, Buffalo I honestly believe that that is a good learning lesson for some of these young guys because Buffalo still runs very similar stuff that they did when Mike Pettin was there a year and a half ago to where he can then say hey look at how this guy handled this gap or this stunt or this whatever and you can teach the guys next week based on seeing it in action. Hey, remember when so-and-so did that dip around you? Here's what I want you to do. And so I think that there can be some good lessons learned with the dual practices this week with Buffalo. No doubt. I, I think, that, first of all, they're tough. They're physical. Uh, yeah. but we're going to find out what, you know, we, we think our offensive line is great. Well, maybe we'll find out how great they are because there, there's probably not a better defensive line in the NFL than the Bills have. And, uh, or, you know, going up against them all week, you're not going to see any tougher defensive lines than, than those guys. So, yeah, it'll be a good test. Uh, uh, and just the, the physical nature of that Bills team, they're, they're rugged. And, uh, you know, the Browns will be tested against a very tough group, especially that DL. And, uh, you know, that can only help uh, going forward. So it'll be interesting to see. And I'll be there Thursday. I was there last week. And uh, I only stayed for three quarters here. I couldn't, you know, uh, I, after, make it, huh? after about, you know, 
the the uh, the exhibition game. Uh, you've heard me say it's the biggest ripoff in all sports to, to pay oh, full yeah. price for that. But uh, because there's it, that that second half, you know, you think the first half didn't really resemble NFL football. Se- second half, there's no excuse for even calling it that because there's nobody playing that's going to be on a roster. I don't think. Obviously, there's some exceptions, but uh, right. You know, could, couldn't handle the fourth quarter, but uh, yeah, this this week should be different. I would think. Uh, you know, by the way, just a little philosophical point here about exhibition football. I don't understand why. Really, you waste three out of four exhibition games. You know, the third game, most people say, is the only one that means anything. The only time it's sort of the dress rehearsal. I, I just don't get it. I, I just think so much time is wasted, and it's sort of everybody's petrified of having players injured. We understand that. Everybody's afraid of that. No one wants to play their starters in the first game longer than one series. Why? I don't know. Even the teams like the Browns that are young and desperately need to get reps against NFL competition for their starters won't do it because that's the way the other 31 teams in the NFL do it, and it's an unwritten rule. I just think so much of those – 16 quarters of, of uh, NFL exhibition season are just completely wasted. And I understand evaluating young players is a part of the process and, and everything else, but, man, when you see them in the first game committing penalties and false starts and jumping off sides and everything else and all the mistakes that they're making, and maybe if you played a little bit in the last month in the four games that you had for that purpose, uh, we wouldn't be having all the problems. So, I don't know, I just, I just think so much of that good – NFL action and exhibition season is uh, is wasted, and a lot of it is just out of fear of injury. Oh, for sure, you know, and I mean, and I get that because that's the the last thing you want. But it's happened for all eternity that guys have gotten hurt in training camp. I mean, how come there's no big uh, big uh, media fuss or fan outrage to end spring training because every once in a while guys need Tommy John surgery after blowing out their elbow during spring training or you know what I mean I mean right. it, that's going to happen you don't want it to happen but it needs to happen to get ready and as you said hey I'm a believer that the Browns going lighter and I think they did. I don't think they went as strong in their off season conditioning this season and I think that that is why everybody on the team has pulled their hamstring in the first part of training camp here because to me, I said that to you last week. I said that is a notorious non conditioning preparation type of injury there when you've got the pulled groins when you've got the pulled hamstrings the strained calves any of those leg muscle injuries that's usually not being fully prepared for the amount of work and the heat that you're going to be doing it in and all of that stuff and especially when you've got 15 20 guys on a on a roster that are all dealing with that and i get it you can't force them in this in this day and age, you mostly it's hands off during the off season. Maybe that speaks to the the mentality of the individual players. And I guess maybe I've never looked around the rest of the league. We're only talking about the Browns. I wonder in general if every team perhaps had a lot of guys with those early uh, type of conditioning type of issues there. Then maybe it's just the feature of not being able to practice them as hard in the off season. But like you say there, and that's that's, that's it's a waste because the more you do it, perhaps the more prepared you are when the speed is at its fullest and and all of that stuff. But but what do you think about? Yeah, that? well, they've all, really all all the teams have all the teams have settled into this. Uh, mode of operating that uh, you know you can't play your ones against the other teams too you know it's almost a formula that the entire league has for you know one series in game one for the starters and then everybody's twos against the twos threes against the threes and uh, you know i guess it's considered bad form or impolite or rude or something to you know leave your starters out there as soon as the other team puts their second team in um you know, I, I just don't get it. I, I think there's uh, obviously player development issues involved and, and getting young guys ready to go. But uh, anyway, don't don't need to harp on it. But I, I was uh, I was impressed with some performances. Uh, Browns didn't run the ball well. And, and game one, hard to tell anything on offense. Maybe, you know, well, what you always say if your offense looks terrible in the, in the exhibition season is, well, they don't want to show too much. You know, that's that's the standard line. Well, we didn't want to show them everything we had, you know. We're, we're keeping it for the regular season. Well, for years, the Browns have been saying that, and the fans <laughs> have been excusing them for it. And, 
and they'll come out and lay an egg on opening day because they can't run an offense. But um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I'm I'm not discouraged about the play calling and and and, and you know that sort of thing. What DiFilippo did, uh, because I think while he had his ones and twos out there, they were executing their plays. They weren't running the ball for big yardage, but like I said, they didn't they didn't even run that many running rushing attempts in the first half. So I think it was I think it was 16 total. Right. But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to how to how they look against a uh, a reasonable middle of the pack NFL team. I think Washington's going to be awful this year. I, I mean, I think Washington is. You know, I think RG three is, is is maybe done. I, I don't know. I, they they obviously their offense moved a lot better with Cousins a quarterback. But I think the rest they could be one of the worst teams in the league as far as I can see. Yeah, which is which is a shame because they've got a great back. They've got they had some some pieces. They were moving somewhere, but yeah, I agree with you. I I totally and that's another reason why it's like, eh, what are you gonna really gauge out of this? You gauge some individual things. I'm very uh, very curious to see this because that you said something at the end there that and that's what I was gonna say. You that last thing you said before you got into RG three is what gets me is that Browns in general. Most seasons, what you'll hear is, well, they're not showing too much in the preseason offensively. And then that first game comes and you go, man, this is exactly what they were showing in the preseason. Yeah, they showed us, they showed us everything they had. And they, were, they, were, they weren't hiding it. They, they, they just don't have it, you know, and that's the thing you worry about. Yeah, well, you know, you can say that they, they lack – certainly it's what's obvious is that they lack – a, a big time playmaker, a wide receiver. We had some opportunities. Uh, who knows whether, uh, you know, beyond Amari Cooper, who we know is great, and they didn't have a crack at, but uh, there were a couple of other, you know, middle of the road uh, potential first round pick uh, wide receivers they could have gone with, from Devontae Parker to some other guys. Um, they didn't. They didn't pull the trigger on that, and, and you know, they still don't have Josh Gordon, so they do lack a big time playmaker on the outside. Um, until you get that guy or guys, uh, you're not going to get yeah. the respect oh, yeah. of the defenses and going to make it harder to run the ball. So maybe there will be some more criticism of Farmer for not going that direction as we get into the season, and, and the lack of that guy hurts us, uh, continues to hurt us uh, in the running and passing game. But uh, time will tell. Who knows? Somebody might step up, and, and maybe Filippo has some uh, – some arrows in the quiver that uh, that he hasn't shown and won't show until we get there. We'll see. We'll talk more about who may step up. I've got some other things to talk about with the quarterbacks of the Browns. But And speaking of quarterbacks of the Redskins, you mentioned Griffin. Kirk Cousins, to me, may end up the starter of that team there, man, because uh, I'm with you on RG3. Although, uh, you know, that first series, by the way, a lot of talk about, hey, Justin Gilbert got better as the game went on. Well, he needed to because he was awful as the game started. He was absolutely smoked on that. Uh, Pierre Garçon should have been gone. If I think he dropped oh, it. Oh, yeah, he sure. Didn't, yeah, he that's, couldn't that's, believe, right in, that's right in front oh, of my seat right there where he dropped he that couldn't ball. Believe, I, yeah, he, I, 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 root he for, I root for I root for Pierre <laughs> Garçon because he's a, he's a Mount Union guy like me. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, he dropped yeah, that. He did play he badly, couldn't believe how open corners, he was. Though, uh, and speaking of corners in RG3, how about Kaylon Williams taking his hat off with that Got uh, him, bro. With that yes, he hit did. on the blitz? That that might have been the best Ooh. defensive play of the day. Just I was going to ask you uh, about that. Having, yeah, having because... Kaylon Williams take out RG3 and knock his helmet off. Yeah, he got in there a couple times, and on that one, bam! And I'm like, wow, man, RG3 didn't even get out of the way of that one. He was blindsided on that. But uh, And you know what? Another thing, real quickly, you mentioned earlier about you know the slacking off and not wanting guys to get hurt. I mean, you kind of saw an example of that there. Niles Paul, you know, if, if another reason things to get go from bad to worse for Washington, man. You see him early on, breaks that ankle. I knew. When the cart comes out, I just looked at Jerry and said, "There's your." when the cart comes out, Oh, oh, did you a, see his yeah. foot? Uh, the angle oh, of the to his leg. It was turned. Oh, I mean, you yeah. could tell that was oh. a that was a big time fracture oh. ankle. That's like what JT Barrett had happen last yes. year, yes, uh, or or worse. And they lost Silas Red too. I mean, the Browns Silas were lucky coming Reed, out of the yeah. game with really no serious injury. Although Connor Shaw surgery this morning. That was where um, I was going next. Was Connor Shaw goes down for the Browns here, and so now, what do you think? 
the the next year. I mean, obviously, a lot of people are going, do they look for somebody else? I think everybody's forgetting. I didn't think that Connor Shaw really was going to be in the mix as if they were keeping three, which I don't think they are anyway. I thought Thaddeus Lewis kind of had the edge on him there anyway. But now Thaddeus Lewis obviously is going to get more of a look here. But what do you, what do you think of, of Connor Shaw going down? Well, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I kind of felt the other way. I kind of felt that Connor Shaw, I'd rather have Connor Shaw as my third guy really? than, than, than Fatty Lou. But uh, only because I thought Connor Shaw acquitted himself pretty well in game 16 last year. Uh, and I had the lead on the Baltimore Ravens in the third quarter, uh, you know, starting a game, starting his first NFL game. So, you know, I didn't. Uh, I, I thought he probably had the edge, and I'm sorry to hear he got hurt. But I got to believe that the Browns are looking at uh, looking at the waiver wire and and looking around the league for another quarterback to sign. Uh, whether they keep three or not, I think they'd be they'd be wise to uh, to be looking outside the organization to see if they can upgrade that position. Obviously, the name Terrell Pryor keeps coming up as a guy yep. who's got NFL starts under his belt, who could be your emergency guy, uh, your third guy. Uh, uh, on a game day, and, and that's obviously a, a possibility if they want to if they want to go that way. But if I were Ray Farmer, I'd be scouting out a uh, an arm to uh, you know to bring in a veteran uh, quarterback to uh, to upgrade that uh, that that third quarterback position, maybe even the second quarterback position. Obviously, it wouldn't take a Johnny Unitas to to jump over Johnny Manziel to be the first backup. <laughs> And you know what, man? While you're while you're talking about bringing in guys to to acquit the position because other guys need need somebody to step up, let's go to the Ray Rice question that's out in the air. You and I haven't talked since Mike Pettin uttered the infamous statement. We have discussed signing Ray Rice, but we're not at that point yet. To me, that means we're gonna sign Ray Rice, and you might as well start getting prepared for it if these guys don't get their stuff together in the next week or two. I'm just going to stop that conversation right here with this dumb move because the guy can't play football anymore whether you want to even talk about dumb move for all the other reasons bringing Ray Rice in I don't know if that speaks poorly more on Crowell and West and those guys or the Browns for thinking it because if if they're seriously looking at a guy who averages like less than Trent Richardson type numbers at this point in his career, then what does that say for their confidence in the backs that they already have? And what do you think about the Browns even admitting that they're considering this guy? I actually think that the Browns uh, and, and other teams too, that have said, yeah, we'd take a look. We consider it. We're thinking about it. Uh, I think it's really just more, a little bit of political correctness that, you know, everybody needs a second chance and redemption and forgiveness and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's it's a nod to Ray Rice to acknowledge that he's out there. But I don't think it's serious, and I, I hope that the Browns aren't serious about it. I, I'd i like to think that it's maybe more of a motivational ploy to, to uh, get Isaiah Crowell and Terrence West and, and uh, whoever else, Duke Johnson, uh, fired up and, and, and ready to compete. Because like you, I agree that even if without the baggage, Ray Rice is a used-up commodity, he hasn't played for a full year, and the last year he did play, he averaged, what, 3.1 a carry and, and, and was a shadow of the back that he had been the, the prior year for the Ravens right. when he was four-point-something per carry. And uh, so, yeah, I just think uh, shelf life, uh, his time is done, his 15 minutes of fame are over, and uh, I don't think he's going to do anything to help this team even if we do sign him. So I, I'm against it. For, for the football reasons alone, like you said, uh, yeah. forget all the rest of it. Uh, but I, I'd like to think that the acknowledgement that, yeah, he's a name that came up and, yeah, we'll consider it. Um, I'd like to think it's just sort of a nod to the, uh, to, to the PC gods to say, okay, uh, yeah, he's a guy who who's a, was a productive back in this league and, uh, you know, sort of a, an acknowledgement that uh, he might deserve a second chance sometime, somewhere to to be forgiven for for his uh, you know brutality. Let's I mean, put it that way. Was, I, I thing, don't want him here. I don't want no, him here. I don't either. I mean, more even more with the back end reasons why. But I was hoping, and I was wondering what you thought. I was hoping that it was simply a like you said, maybe every team in the league use it as a hammer 
over the guys that you got. Like, hey, listen, this guy is out here and he's looking for a job. Let's float this out here. And maybe Crow goes home and his agent says, hey, you better step it up or West or whatever, you know, because obviously they're looking to fire up their guys. I, I believe that that is clearly what the Browns want. I mean, they don't want to. I mean, no team is looking to bring that lightning rod into their organization to begin with. I mean, it would have to be a desperation move. And I honestly was hoping in my gut that most of that was a shout out to the players and their agents. Hey, we will do something if somebody doesn't step up and take this job. And I think hopefully they're just using it to fire their guys up. Speaking of other. other yeah. And, things, and, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, some of these hamstrings are getting better. I mean, uh, Duke yeah. Johnson's back in practice <laughs> this week. So is, uh, so is prior. Uh, and I'm not sure I heard Joe Hayden was out with a hamstring too. I, that's the worst news of the week, but if, um, yeah, I know, I don't know what his situation is or how, how serious this thing is. It might just be resting them. If it maybe felt a little bit tight or something. I haven't heard a, a detailed report on that, but maybe Duke Johnson can be the guy that lights that fire. I hope that the Browns aren't in, uh, anything close to desperate straits, uh, in terms of their running backs. I hope it's all motivational stuff. And, and, uh, certainly I think we've got, three capable guys there if yep. not now, there's not a superstar among them but uh, uh you know certainly i think crowell is the closest to a guy who could be a quote-unquote star in this league uh but again i haven't heard much Gary, about what his issues are whether it's motivation whether it's uh you know intellect or or you know blocking or other aspects of his game besides the running that where they feel he's lacking um but, uh, yeah, whatever they can do to, to, to crank him up, obviously he and West both have, I think, NFL talent and middle-of-the-road average, above-average NFL talent. And I hope we're not in, uh, in, in desperation mode just yet, certainly. And, and I'll tell you what, I'm just going to say this as far as – I know that he should be fired up anyway, and it's his first – you know, it's obviously Duke Johnson's a rookie and all of that, and he should have all that motivation anyway. But if I'm him, hearing all of this stuff – you know, while he's healing up his hamstring, taking mental reps, which is the Browns' favorite word in the first two weeks of training camp. Everybody took hell of a lot of great mental reps here in camp. So uh, to right. me, that just means the they're bicycle. not ready to. Yeah, they're not ready to play football. He said they said that about Manziel the one day. I was laughing so hard at how hard they were trying to sell it. Uh, D. Filippo when they when he said, "Well, Johnny was out today, but boy, he took." some hellified mental reps. I mean, he had one incredible day of mental reps today. As a matter of fact, I think that was the exact sentence. He had an incredible day of mental reps today. And I'm going, first off, how do you evaluate that? Like, how do you know how well they did mentally with this stuff? But to me, that just means they're not ready to actually play football. They're just watching everybody else play. But if I'm Duke Johnson, if I'm his agents, if I'm his pride, if I'm his sense of opportunity, I'm going... No, Ray Rice, Duke Johnson can take this job, can step in and come in hungry and maybe light a fire under Crow and West. I think once one guy steps up and really starts like moving ahead of the pack, then you may see the rest of the guys kind of get maybe with a lot of young guys because they're all young. Every back that they've got is what, second year or first year guys pretty much. They don't have maybe that, that little – Whatever it is that you should have to fire yourself. I don't know. I'm not trying to make excuses, but clearly they need something to get them a little bit jacked up. And maybe Duke Johnson is that guy. Speaking of jacked up, though, I want to shift off for a minute. Injuries and all that stuff we're talking about. This isn't the Browns, but uh, it sounds like a story that would come out of some past Browns regimes anyway. How about the Jets? The other day, you, we haven't been on the air in a week. I mean, what kind of what kind of garbage comes out of a training camp when your starting quarterback gets laid out by a jabroni linebacker, and and then the, he gets signed the next day, by the way, by another team, which is fantastic. But I mean, how about that? I don't care who's mad that somebody owes you know millionaires owe each other six hundred bucks. That's like me owing you fifty cents. But uh, anyways, man, what, what 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 do you think about that whole Geno mess debacle there with the Jets? Well, it's crazy, and and if anything, it uh, it allows the the word dysfunctional to be used in in association with another team, not ours. You know, so that's cool. Um, you know, you, you like to have the dysfunction happen in somewhere else for a change. But yeah, and the other thing was, it's a real head scratcher for 
for people that are, you know, like, say, for example, fans of the team that have the Jets as their week one opponent in the NFL, whether or not Geno Smith getting knocked out for six weeks is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, when you look at uh, quarterback rating for Geno Smith versus quarterback rating for who, Ryan Fitzpatrick or, you know, whoever's going to be his uh, his substitute, you know, I don't know if I'd rather face Ryan Fitzpatrick on opening day or, or Geno Smith. I kind of was pulling for Geno to be in there, frankly. But uh, anyway, it just sort of shows that the Jets are, are nowhere in terms of their quarterback situation, just like uh, the Browns team really is. And, uh you know, but yeah, it's I, I'm just it's just refreshing to see uh, the New York media being able to obsess a little bit about some dysfunction in their own ranks, and uh, and and have it be somebody else and not us. Oh, absolutely, man. But I mean, it's just the silliness. And and I mean, you know what got me too is that the media somehow a lot of portions of it took to blaming Geno Smith for that situation. Like, he had anything to do with that. I mean, seriously, there's a lot of, right off the bat, it's people like, man, I knew this guy was garbage. This guy's bad news. Look at what Geno Smith, Geno Smith turned around the corner and got sucker punched. I mean, I don't know what he did here to be such an awful person. And again, I heard that it was over literally, what, $600 or something like that. And it was uh, An airfare, a plane fare. Airfare, yeah, right. Uh, he bought a know, plane ticket. Paid for, and, a, paid for a plane yeah. fare, and the guy didn't use it. Exactly. And he said, I'll get you the money back or whatever, and then he hadn't got it back to him fast enough yet. So the guy had to go get his respect or whatever, you know. And then, But to me, what do you think about the guy getting dropped and re-signed right off the bat? Who would bring that guy into, into, into a locker room after that? I guess the same people that said it was Geno Smith's fault, you know. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know. Same people that same people that said he was asking for it, man, uh, by by confronting the guy, uh, this this uh, untested rookie, uh, non uh, non drafted player for, you know, six hundred dollars. No, I I don't know. You know, I don't know a lot about the circumstances of it, other than what what we just said there. Um, who, do you know who it was that signed him? Yeah, I mean, it was maybe Buffalo. The... It was Ryan and Buffalo. Oh, That's okay. Who so Ryan him. knew the kid. Uh, you yeah. know, knew him, knew his background. Probably, you know, might have might have had something to do with signing him. Uh, so that there was some familiarity there. Obviously, he'll be there with, this uh, week. With Rex Ryan he'll, he'll, the he'll be there this week. Maybe but, uh, he sucker punches one of us. Who knows, man? <laughs> yeah. I'm well, you know, when, when someone right. talks about, you know. Signing Ray Rice or signing Greg Hardy or, or, or these other guys uh, that have done far worse things, um, it, it's hard to get worked up over uh, signing a guy who just took a swing. I mean, because you know, obviously, even it's not to you're... defend the guy; it's just to say, relatively speaking, it's not uh, it's not like beating up your wife, uh, knocking your wife out cold in an elevator. So you know, it, <laughs> it's uh, at, at least at least the person that he hit was a guy. But absolutely. But that's a great point. Great point. But here's my thing. You know, you know, you listen to what Rex Ryan said and he's like his quote was if we didn't think he'd be successful on the field in the locker room, blah blah blah, he wouldn't be here. And and we're not trying to justify what he did. It was a mistake. Bull to me. I don't care even if there was a more justification than what there is. My thing is is this is a guy that's so selfish that no matter what his personal issue is, and this wasn't even a very big, it's not like he's that, like this was a, such yeah. a meaningless thing, but the guy had so little respect for the team, for the, I mean, that's, he, he knocked out the starting quarterback for 10 weeks of the season. That is a dangerous level of stupidity because clearly you don't think about anything except whatever's important to you. Why could you risk having a guy that's that much of a loose cannon in your locker room. That's there would be. Yeah, you're, you're right. But you know, coaches, you know how coaches are. Uh, they think they have magical powers of, of persuasion. They think so much of themselves, their own coaching egos tell them you can manage this guy. You can turn this guy around. You oh, yeah. can, you know, make a solid citizen out of this guy. Um, uh, because that's what the coaches' egos do to them. They think they're different. They think, well, the only reason this guy's a bad actor is he hasn't had me as his coach yet. You know, so and, and you see it all the time where coaches, Jim Tressel and uh, Ray Small or, or Terrell Pryor or whatever, they, they 
they think that their own powers of persuasion and 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 uh, powers of leadership and, and example are going to be enough to uh, to make a difference in a guy that uh, to this point <laughs> nothing has made a difference for him. So who knows? I, I just think, and I think Rex Ryan has got an ego like that. Absolutely. You're listening to the Sports Fix. J-Rock, Dan Wismar, we're talking about the Browns and all the latest surrounding them. They're in Buffalo here, a couple days of scrimmages. And you know what? It's funny because this we were talking about Rex Ryan. His quote, I was going to ask you about it earlier. We got away from it. But talking about him now signing this guy and just that mentality, uh, they were talking uh, earlier last week about the possibility of some scraps at the practices. And how did Rex Ryan say it? He said, we're going to do business with the Browns the way they do business with us or something like that to basically saying, Hey man, the more physical they want to make this thing, then the more physical we'll get with it. I have no doubt that there's going to be a few scraps over the next couple of days between these two teams. Yeah, that might be. And I just heard something this morning, uh, I can't even remember what the source of it was about teams that are doing that, that scrimmaging that are instituting a no fighting policy uh, between the two teams. In other words, in advance of anything happening, coaches, uh, front offices stepping up and saying there will be no fights in this, uh, in these practices or in these scrimmages, uh, which I think is, is kind of admirable, kind of a good idea right up front to say, Hey, you know, this is done in the in the spirit of uh, uh, you know competition and and preparation for the season, and it's not done and uh, you know in the spirit of any kind of uh, you know animosity. And we're just not going to permit it. We're just not going to have it. Kind of rule it out on the front end. I thought that was uh, you know we'll see how that works out. Uh, but uh, and I can't remember what two teams it was. I think there were two sets of teams. In fact, that I heard were doing a similar thing with that. You know stated right up front there will be no fighting and uh like i said we'll see how that plays out but i thought at least the concept of it when you get two football teams together to sort of lay down some ground rules right at the outset was a pretty good idea absolutely carlos dansby's quote was one of my favorites we're on a mission we've got a vision but if the line gets crossed, then we're going to cross it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I think the so did you hear? So, just... Jerry, I wanted to ask you if you heard about the uh, the quarterback at Ohio State who converted to a wide receiver. Um, I've heard a thing or two about that. Man, what is it, by the way, with these Ohio State quarterbacks switching to wide receiver? But anyways, yes. Well, they, uh, they, want, they want to play. You know, that's absolutely. the deal. They want to play. Did you see what he said, so, too? Yeah, the, he was, Braxton Miller was was saying, I can't remember when he said it, but I saw the quote when he said, man, it's kind of like playing in a video game, man. It's definitely a, a new experience there. What have you heard about his work thus far in this transition? Well, I think it's it's going well. I mean, most people are saying they had a scrimmage the other day, and it was close to media, but word inevitably leaks out. Uh, the, the big word about that scrimmage, two things. Uh, one is the quarterback switching to wide receiver that I that I mentioned as Torrance Gibson, uh, who is a uh, incoming freshman uh, from uh, from Florida, uh, left-handed kid who whose highlight film a, a year ago when I watched this kid's senior highlight film I said the guy the guy looks like Randy Moss he reminds me of Randy Moss he's six four two hundred he's blazing fast in the open field long strider long lean guy played quarterback in high school left-handed. Uh, All-American kid, you know, made all the All-Star games and and came to Columbus as a QB. Well, it, it's obvious to anyone coming into Columbus as a QB that it's going to be a while before you play, pal, because we got some young quarterbacks here you might have heard. <laughs> and uh, so he approaches uh, Urban Meyer and says, I want to play. And so they put him on a wide receiver. And I guess the kid just dazzled everybody in the scrimmage the other day. Um, you know, he just has – off the charts athletic ability, sky jumping and just good hands and blazing fast. So he's big time and he's going to play receiver for the Buckeyes. And, and he's a little bit under the radar in, in the incoming freshman class just because of the fact that he was a QB and no one thought he would play. There's always been talk about him converting to wide receiver, uh, but it's never come from him. Uh, and uh, it's always just sort of people projecting where he might be. So anyway, he's a receiver. That was one big story from the scrimmage. The other big story was Mike Weber. Yeah, uh, coming in with the imported back from, Detroit, from Detroit, baby. Yeah, yeah who, who comes in, and, and he had about 15 carries. For, and he, this is a, a quote from him. He wasn't sure how many yards he'd have, but he thought it was about 200. 
uh, on 15 carries <laughs> in the scrimmage with several touchdowns, some, you know, un- unknown number of touchdowns, but several. You know, so, you know, that, that opened people's eyes, and he's all, already being penciled in as a potential uh, first backup to Zeke Elliott at the running back spot. He, he's just uh, a special special kid, you know, speed, feet, moves, vision, the, the whole package, and about a, a 5, 10, 200-pound running back. So the pipeline those are is the two open. big – the big youngsters. And the other thing was Isaiah Prince, a big offensive tackle, who was the first guy to have his his uh, black stripe removed. You know how Urban does that with the black stripe on the helmet for the freshmen yeah. until they until they know what it's like or show what they know what it's like to be a Buckeye. They they wear the black stripe on the helmet, and it's a big ceremonial thing to get your black stripe removed. Well, the first two freshmen for the Buckeyes to have them removed are Isaiah Prince, the big offensive tackle from from uh, Pennsylvania, or maybe it's New Jersey, Maryland. That's what it is. And uh, and my and now Mike Weber, the running back, was the second one to have his taken off. So things are progressing. But but uh, as far as Braxton goes, Jerry, and get back to your original question, um, I saw a little bit of film of him working with Joey Galloway. Uh, just some some tutoring, some techniques, some wide receiver, uh, you know, techniques that he was learning from Galloway. And the thing that just blew me away was the first step. I mean, Braxton, you know how elusive he is and how quickly he accelerates. I can just see him lining up in the slot and, and leaving a DB standing there at the line of scrimmage while Braxton's five yards down the field. I mean, that's what that's what was going on there. He gives us a little shake move, and he is just gone by you. And, uh, and, you know, three or four yards down the field before you even realize that he's gone. So I, I just think that's going to be the way that they want to use him, get him off the line, either that or get him the ball behind the line of scrimmage and just let him run. It'll, I'm sure we'll get some – some pitch sweeps and some 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 uh, bubble screens like that. But uh, I also think coming out of a slot, maybe on a, a safety or whatever, depending on who else they've got on the field, uh, just leaving some guys in the dust with the acceleration. I just think that's where he's going to really make hay. Uh, but I think uh, you don't want to mark him down for 40 catches for the season or anything. Because I don't. There's so many weapons they have, and he might only get two, three looks or you know four or five looks a game. Um, and, and, you know, remember, it's really you don't want to expect a whole lot more than that, especially in his first year as a receiver. But he's going to help him, and he'll be dangerous, and he'll be something for defensive coordinators to think about. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, just another weapon in a arsenal of them yeah. there, uh, that, that Urban has this year. Absolutely. You know, speaking of that arsenal of those weapons, the wide receivers, those offensive guys, for the most part, pretty healthy first week of camp here. But Dontre Wilson re-aggravated that foot injury. You know, it cost him some time last year. So that may open up some opportunity there. But they're so deep at that position. Think about this. I mean, there's not even a lot of uh, concern. I mean, most schools, imagine a a player with the potential and the caliber of of Dontre Wilson. It'd be a bigger, much bigger story than it is here because not that you're not concerned but a hopefully he'll be back you know in a couple of days and they were talking perhaps today but uh it, they're so deep at those skill positions it's such an embarrassment it's, of riches. yeah that that age factor it's just ridiculous you yeah. know Dontre wilson is out so that means we're gonna have to rely on Jalen marshall braxton right. and <laughs> you know that's all we've got left at the age factor, oh know? they're in trouble now it's, man it's, you know? it's crazy crazy how deep they are Absolutely. You know what? Hey, you know, it's funny, too. When I was looking at the injury report, I only just happened to notice just one. We mentioned that with the Browns, the opposite here. Ohio State came in well, uh, well conditioned. You know, that's what I was saying. I'm curious about that whole hamstring thing, if it's the same around the league. But uh, Marshawn Lattimore, really the only one in the first part of uh, of camp that had that issue for the Buckeyes. Again, I, I look at that in general as a conditioning issue. Haven't you always seen that that way? Those type of injuries are usually just not being prepared for the amount of work that you're going to do in the early part of camp? It seems that way. And, uh, of course, the Buckeyes had Mickey Marotti. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much or how hard the NFL guys – do I mean you hear about him working in the off season uh, and conditioning and lifting and and all that stuff? But I tell you, when you're in college, you're you're a captive audience. And uh, Mickey Marotti's yes. got these guys all winter, all summer, um, and uh, you know they're on a program and they are watched and monitored, and they're not allowed to be coached in football stuff. But man, when you're in a big time college football program. 
like I said, you're, you're a captive audience, captive group. You can't go anywhere, and their eyes are always on you, and you're graded and you're evaluated based on how hard you work in the offseason. And so I think it's an advantage, certainly conditioning-wise. I think the Buckeyes proved last uh, January uh, when they – literally took over games in the fourth quarter against Michigan State. Obviously, the Wisconsin thing was wire to wire, but both the Alabama and the Oregon game, those games were close after three quarters. Ohio State won both of those playoff games in the fourth quarter by just dominating the fourth quarter. Uh, and that's not a coincidence. Uh, that's Mickey Marotti at work. That's the conditioning that they've gone through all year. And, and Meyer's talking this week about, you know, survival mode. You know, that's what they're in right now. It's it's heavy work, and, and they push and they push and they push. Uh, and uh, it's one thing that Meyer's made a, made a point of since he's been here. He showed up here, and he was shocked and you know about how out of shape uh, Trestle's team was uh, and, and really the level of conditioning was just not up to par. It's one of the first things he noticed, one of the first things he commented about. And he's been working for three years to turn it around, and he has. He, he proved it last January in the playoffs. Absolutely, you know, and and, it, and I don't know. I just uh, I, I was just curious if you were in the same place as me on that because you see, and that's a great point because that's a that's a hell of a conditioned team there, and I, I know the difference is that there's very much not the limitations as uh, there is when it comes to the pro guys, you know, and and part of it too is is so many guys in general train more as you said for strength, power. People get caught up in that aspect of it and and really it, it's as much the cardio it's as much the the stretching the running all of those type of things too but Ohio State clearly a very well conditioned team you can see that by the way they reported into camp and have held up uh, through the first by the way just talking about camp as we wrap things up here i just saw this come across my feed Ohio State offensive lineman transferred to Kentucky, Marcellus Jones. He's been released here. I don't know if that was just today or over the weekend. Violated. I, I just heard. Rules. I just saw it this morning before I yeah. got on the phone with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was the kid. He's one of the Glenville kids. Uh, right. He came. He came down to Ohio State and and uh, ran afoul of uh, of the program. Basically, just didn't do what he was going to do, and he was sort of. Uh, he was given a little bit of a boost out the door when he transferred to Kentucky. Uh, uh, and I think it was more academics than anything else that, that got him, uh, you know, in trouble at Ohio state. But, and I have no idea what it was that got him dismissed from the program, but he, this was uh, his first uh, summer camp. And, and he obviously didn't, didn't last long enough to probably uh, get to know how to spell his roommate's last name down there in Kentucky because he, he, uh, is only there for a few weeks before he got bounced out of that program. So uh, obviously the instincts looked like they were right uh, when, when Urban let him go from here. He was uh, promising athletically, but they say uh, just never wanted to work hard enough to take advantage of the talent. And that kind of attitude doesn't fly with Urban Meyer, and he was he was gone from here. Man, I'll tell you, that just goes to show you that t- talent is only just a piece of, of the total equation. Plus, my, one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I've lived it and learned it myself, is that hard work will always beat talent when talent doesn't work hard. I mean, that's the uh, the truth. And sometimes when people, you we hear it all the time, you get numb. You get numb to sports speak all the time, like character issues, but that's not just a catchphrase for a guy who doesn't pay his parking tickets or whatever. That's something that doesn't always go away. You talk about a guy getting a fresh start somewhere, but as you see, clearly the problem is sometimes with the with the individual, you know, and that's why those things matter because a guy could be the great man. The Browns could have the next Jim Brown walk into camp here, but if the guy can't show up to practice on time, if he can't follow the rules of the game, if he can't pass a drug test, he does no good for you to sign him to the team because he's not going to be available to you anyway. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, you, there's uh, litters, uh, littered with examples of the, uh, the, 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 this team even. I mean, the guy that comes to mind is, uh, is Maurice Claret, of course, who a world of talent and uh, just couldn't make it work because he didn't have the maturity to, uh, to be a good teammate and to, uh, you know, obey the law and to not walk around with his hand out looking for something everywhere he went. So it, it was just unfortunate. And to his credit, you know, he's grown up a lot. He's a, he's a mature, sensible young man now, but uh, had to make a lot of mistakes and, and go through a lot of uh, grief and cause his teammates and team a lot of grief before he finally grew up. For sure. Dan Wismar, my man, what are you working on this week for everybody hates Cleveland? 
you know, I'm going to try to get some Buckeye stuff done. I've been, uh, I've been, you know, busy with other things. I haven't got as much writing done as I wanted to, but uh, there's all kinds of good storylines for Buckeye stuff uh, coming up. So keep your eye on everybody at HateCleveland.com, and I'll have something up there this week. All right, Wednesday, you and I will do the thing again. We'll talk a little bit about the Browns' couple days of practice here. We'll see where the the Buckeyes are at. We got the Indians and the Red Sox kicking off a series here, so we'll have quite a few things to talk about here Wednesday when we catch back up. Sounds good, Jerry. Look forward to being back with you. Thanks for having you got me. It. As usual. My man, Dan Wismar. You guys can always tweet with them on Twitter at D Wismar. You can hit him up on everybodyhatescleveland.com. Check out all of his stuff. And also, of course, it's always fed through all of our sites here uh, through the Sports Fix. You can check it out as all the Everybody Hates Cleveland stuff comes out there, guy. We're going to take a break. Final break of the day. Don't go anywhere when we come back. Still a few more things to talk about and catch up on. I'll crack the phones 216 539 75 Three five. Talk a little bit. Hey, LeBron James sending a whole bunch of people to college. Forty, what, forty-one million dollars worth, man. That's a. Hey, when people do stuff like that, I, uh, I definitely take notice. I mean, I get it that the guy's got about you know forty-one billion dollars, but still, that's no chump change right there. Let's talk about that. Talk about the Gladiator season coming to an end. Set the stage for the Indians and the Red Sox and more. Final segment of the fix coming up next. Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business, or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there, Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer. Business cards, signs, banners, yard signs, mobile advertising, anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them, too, is each of their locations, whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania, it's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit FantasyJocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts, starts getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. <laughs> I mean, a really real prize. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious. Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. In baseball, miracles can happen when a team works together. Two out, bottom of the ninth, down to their last strike. The same is true in the fight against cancer. That's why MLB has teamed up with Stand Up to Cancer. Because we believe that when we all stand up together, 41,000 on their feet, we can make cancer history. Now everybody's standing. What a buzz in this building. This is beyond a dream. 
Stand up with MLB at StandUpToCancer.org. The Sports Fix is now available every day on the world's largest internet radio service, iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeartRadio app, subscribe to the show, and get your fix. This is the Sports Fix. What is your name? I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or um, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Dude, what do you want? Uh, well, it's uh, this rug I have. It really tied the room together. Uh, we are not a show to be swept under the rug. We are a show to be heard. He's the Sports, Sports Fix. Fix. Speaking of wake up late for school, man, I mean, my kids woke up on time, but they sure as hell went back to school today. Can you believe it? Back in school on August the 17th, man, I think my generation, I think we'd have had a sit-in or something. We'd have had to riot, man. I don't know about all that, man. Is, Is it just me or is this ridiculously early? for people to go back to school here. Cleveland Public actually many people actually some schools started in the in the middle part of last week, but this is still to me quite quite early for the school year to get started. I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, I remember always starting school back after the holiday weekend coming up at the beginning of September and uh, they've moved it up. And I know we've got snow days now that get in the way with stuff here in Cleveland. And since they're, you know, so sissified, any time that it even, you know, sniffs of snow, we have to take the day off because we don't know how to shovel our way out of anything here in Cleveland. So in order to give these kids the, the, you know, 37 snow days off that they need here to get through the winter, we now have to start the school year in the middle of, you know, July. I'm just kidding. But uh, anyways, my kids are back in school today. That was definitely a... Uh, Ah, sucks to them, but anyways, let's get back into it. Welcome back to the Sports Fix. J-Rock with you, wrapping things up. Speaking of sucks for them, suck for the Gladiators this weekend as the Cleveland Gladiators knocked out of the Arena League playoffs here in a a different ending than last year. Of course, last year was such a, a, a dream season for them. They only lost one game all season long. They were the best team in the AFL. They ran it straight through to the Arena Bowl, hosted it here in Cleveland. They lost, of course, in the Arena Bowl to the uh, Arizona Rattlers, but this year, not even near that far as they played 500 ball all season long. Pretty much smacked around four different times this this season by the Philadelphia Soul. 47-35, to they were knocked out the other day. A game performance for the Gladiators on Saturday, but they went 0 for 4 this season against the Philadelphia Soul. Philadelphia, the best team in the league. Gladiators finish at 8 and 10 on the regular season, and then they lose their first playoff game here to the Soul. Philadelphia will move on in the playoffs, and it was the end of a rough up and down year for the Cleveland Gladiators. Plus, it was a bad end of the season stretch for them, too. They lost 6 of their final seven games. Gladiators had this game, had control early on in this thing. I mean, the the Gladiators were rolling until the Philadelphia Soul got rolling, and they were down eight early in the game. They rolled off 31 unanswered points to take the the lead and take the game against the Gladiators. They now move on to the title game of the American Conference. Philadelphia 10 and 0 at home this season, 16 and 3 overall. Congrats to the Glads for making the playoffs again and they'll get back at it next spring with another Arena Football League season. We'll catch up with Doug Plagans here. He'll get a few weeks of vacation here at the end of the season. He'll be coming right back with Monster Season. So Doug will be joining us here on the Sports Fix uh, soon enough, but uh, congrats to him and the Gladiators and it's a shame 
that it ended for them this weekend in Philadelphia. You know what? Talk about a couple of things from over the weekend that I wanted to really mention. One article that caught my attention Friday as I was heading out of town and I made a mental note that this was, hey, look, I'm the first one that has never been the best friend of LeBron James and all this stuff. You guys know. I'm very transparent about my feelings about things. I speak my mind, and uh, but I gotta, I've got to give props where props are due. And LeBron James announced the other day, and I say this all the time about guys with with big money and and all the things that come with it. There's big responsibilities and commitments, and I do have to say, LeBron James does always uh, handle business. On that side of things, no matter what you think about him as a person, as a player, as an individual, he's a hell of a guy, and he's definitely uh, very much a benevolent benefactor in many ways when it comes to the children, particularly in his Akron, Ohio community here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, LeBron announced that the LeBron James Foundation is pairing up with the University of Akron, and they have sponsored over a thousand college scholarships for everybody who is currently enrolled in his I Promise program. Every one of them that follows their way through school, LeBron James has now made a commitment that he will pay their full tuition costs if they make it to college. Uh, And the average year's tuition is about $10,000 at the University of Akron. So he has now made the commitment to these kids, which to me makes their commitment back to getting to college. That's the whole point of this is, hey, you get there and I'll take care of business for you. So now over a thousand, actually it's it's over 1,100 kids out there now have a, a set goal. You make it there and you can get through there. LeBron James committing over 40, I believe it's $42 million, which is the basically the salary that he made last year and this year with the Cavaliers combined. Of course, a drop in the bucket, but regardless, you don't even worry about that now. You're talking about 1,100 plus kids, 10 grand a year for four years of college. LeBron James commits $42 million to the children of the community and the I Promise program in Akron. Say whatever you will about the guy, like him or not, that's a hell of a thing. And I wanted to end my show taking my head off to that and to LeBron and his foundation for what they did there. It's putting your money where your mouth is, baby. That's for sure. Indians getting ready to go at it with the Boston Red Sox here. Fenway Park is the location tonight. Danny Salazar and Matt Barnes, 7 10 first pitch. Trevor Bauer, Eduardo Rodriguez tomorrow at 7 10. And the same story. Start time on Wednesday. Corey Kluber and Joe Kelly wrapping that series up. First meeting between these two teams this year, as I mentioned. Indians come into this game. They're 5-5 five and five in their last 10 games. Still eight games under 500. Six games back in the wild card if you're still looking at that number as well. They've only got, you know, every team in the American League to climb over. But, hey, it's a six-game deficit there. So we'll see what they do tonight as it starts. Indians have started off this 11 game. They're on the road for most of the next uh, 25 days. They've got an 11-game road trip, come home for five, and then a 10-game road trip. They're 1-2. and two so far dropping the last two in Minnesota they're 10 and 10 against the American League East this year Red Sox took two or three over the weekend as they start a 10 game homestand for them we'll see what happens tonight and tomorrow Wednesday we'll be here to talk about it Dan Wismar will be back with us as always on Wednesdays BJ Riddell, author of Fantasy Football for Winners, is with us. Hey, guys, we've got some openings in the Sports VIX Fantasy Football Challenge. We've got about four or five team openings right now. It's a 14-team league. First come, first serve. Send us the message if you want to get in, and we'll hook you up. The winner gets a brand-new championship belt from our good friends at FantasyJocks.com. Sign up now. The draft will be September 8th. Two days before the start of the season, it'll be all online so you can do it from wherever you live in the country. If you want in, send us a message, send us an email, the sports fix at AOL.com. Hit me up on Facebook or Twitter. Say you want a spot in the league. First come, first serve, and you can get yourself in this year's Sports Fix Fantasy Football Challenge. And our guru, BJ Riddell. Fantasy Football for Winners resumes on Wednesday. Dan Wismar will be here and so much more. Same bad time, same bad channel. Noon, Daddy. And we'll be on time this Wednesday noon right here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond. Have some fun. Go Tribe. Enjoy the games. We'll be back here Wednesday live right here on the Sports Fix.
go. Welcome to the Cleveland show, but this ain't no cartoon. Reality is all we know. You're tuning in the Bravo. Yeah, you hear me everywhere, but it's only one of me. Let me make that very clear. Yeah, I'm from that terminal. You can see the lake from here. Faith in my teens, we keep getting closer every year. But we got the king, though, so hopefully we overcome. Yes, I have a dream, and I know I ain't the only one. Uh-huh. Armadale tried to step my heart, but we brought it back. Thanks to Cleveland Clinic, now they call them Kiss the Cardiac. Rock cars, science center, Tower City, all of that. Warehouse, district, Euclid Corridor, and all the flat. You know that I'm a tribes fan, and I love slime in. Crockett Park's the perfect place for me to spend some time in. Baby, this is Cleveland. It is so much more to us. You can even go to Severance Hall to see an orchestra. Hey. Cleveland, we were all- 